Good afternoon. Uh, we would like to start uh, this session. It's a parallel session on readiness. Uh, I would like to invite our distinguished panel members to join me in the stage. Her Excellency Nisreen Tamimi, Chairman of the Environmental Quality Authority, Environment Quality Authority, Palestine. Dr. Jace jo Joyel Clark, Minister, Ministry of Sustainable Development, St. Kitts. Deputy John, Deputy Minister Kuma, Ministry of Finance of Ghana. And Mr. Stefania Nawadra, Director General of SPRE. Ministers and distinguished panel members, if you could join me in the stage. So many thanks to honorable ministers for your kind presence and um, in this session, uh, which whose title is, um, how can readiness resources address the needs of countries to advance climate investments? A very important topic, which is close to the heart of uh, many of you. It's good to see a good number of participants that join us in this session. Thank you very much for your active uh, uh, participation. So um, as, a, as a short introduction, we would like to make this, uh, this uh, discussion interactive and we would have uh, short questions and hopefully our panel members could respond to these uh, in not more than three minutes each so that we could have a, a number of rounds of questions. Um, so having said this, I would like to then maybe start um, this discussion. So you've already been introduced to our distinguished uh, panel members. Uh, let me start by introducing the first topic uh, that we will discuss with our distinguished panel today. Um, and this topic is sharing insights on the barriers to address, focusing on the current readiness program in translating climate change strategies and priorities into investment plans and funding proposals. Uh, we have about 25 minutes for this uh, particular segment. And um, we will uh, then uh, take two questions in, in, this, uh, in this first round. So the first question we would like to direct to Her Excellency, Dr. Nisreen Tamimi. Um, uh, Your Excellency, what capacities at government level are lacking in countries where readiness can provide support to translate climate change strategies into investment plans and funding proposals? Thank you. Uh, distinguished staff of uh, Green Climate Fund, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, it's my pleasure to join you today in this conference representing the state of Palestine. Palestine is a small country with so many challenges. It's located in climate change affected area. It's a hot spot area for pollution due to high density cities all around the coasts of the Mediterranean. It is in the core of political and military unrest places in the world. Palestine, as you all know, may know, is under occupation that has been there for too long. It's affected every aspect of our lives, including our ability to plan or decide over the use of resources. We struggled and still do, to be recognized as an independent state. We fought to join, to join the United Nations Framework on Climate Change Conventions and other environmental conventions. We are trying to be ready to the day we obtain the full, indep the full independence. This exactly where the readiness come into action. And this is exactly why the readiness program of the Green Climate Fund is so important to us. <clears throat> the readiness program of the Green Climate Fund is an important tool for developing countries to strengthen their capacities to alleviate and cope with the adverse effect of climate change and to benefit from the fund dedicated to mitigation and adaptation through the Green Climate Fund. Uh, 
It's an important vehicle to pave, to pave the road to implement priority projects listed in State of Palestine NDCs. These projects are in urgent need for receiving funds and come into reality. However, we need a lot of capacities and needs. One of them actually, we have the occupation limitations and there's an urgent need. The problem that in occupation, that we don't have the control of the resources or the occup uh, occupation, uh, Israel occupation, control the resources or control the borders. In terms of control of resources, we are talking about more than 60% of our land is in the area C. What does it mean area C? That we don't have any ability to control our water resources or land there. So the implementation of any uh, kind of projects, it's very risky and uh, it's very difficult. Second, when we are talking about the control of borders, so this is mean that we have other challenges that we cannot import the materials, which is uh, very important for a uh, project's implementation or for infrastructure, for example. Also fund restriction, it's not an easy to get the fund due to this uh, uh, control of border. Further, there's a problem in the technology transfer also due to this uh, uh, control. Uh, for example, due to the um, uh, challenges or the control in the border, it's not an easy to have uh, uh, expertise to come to Palestine, freely to come to Palestine in order to support us in their experience or to transfer their technology. And this is actually, we are facing this problem uh, every time because we cannot give them uh, we don't have the ability to give them permission to come to our land. We have to take this permission from Israel State, Israel occupation. Also, we have a limited access to fund. Example, one example of this, the uh, GIF, actually, we cannot have the direct, uh, we cannot get direct fund for, uh, from GIF. We can have it only if we have a regional project or, or, or through the non-governmental uh, organizations. So this is the main issues. Thank you very much. I think um, highlights uh, probably the importance of uh, capitalizing on the readiness program. And uh, I think there are a lot of opportunities such as cited by the, uh, your excellency on, uh, in this regard. Um, we can then go on to um, the second question to uh, to uh, Excellency uh, Minister uh, Joel Clark. And the question goes as follows. Minister, how can countries spark the involvement of private sector in climate action? How can GCF readiness support help governments to establish this uh, promotion of linking to the private sector? Minister? Thank you so much. It's important for GCF for finance in particular, climate finance in particular, to recognize that there is no one approach to investments in climate finance or in climate action. For example, St. Kitts and Nevis is a twin island state, very small, one of, I think, the smallest nation in the Caribbean. And our localized realities make it such that any private sector investment must consider a multiplicity of issues. For example, the immediacy on returns. There must be a simplified process to investment in climate action on the part of the private sector and the long-term partnerships between government and the private sector must also be well established for there to be any investment in the first place. We must ensure that the relationship is mutually beneficial for governments that probably function in five-year cycles or five-year election cycles and private sector entities which function in 10 to 20-year medium to long-term cycles and look for investment. There must be something that bridges what government wants in the short term and what the private sector is looking for in terms of long-term investment. In terms of GCF helping governments to 
you know, in spark private sector involvement. We must also never forget the role of government in this. The reality, especially for Caribbean states, when you function on a five-year election cycle, you are not inclined to invest in any project that goes beyond that election term because every government wants to excel in its current term. So investment must match that very limited approach to climate action, but must also ensure that the private sector investment is worth it. Additionally, there are some very key things that must be considered such as reducing risk. Government is not, especially when resources are scarce, government is not inclined to invest in any project that has too much risk. Neither is the private sector, especially in small island states like St. Kitts and Nevis. Additionally, what are the tangibles? What can we promote as a government or what can the private sector look towards to incentivize investment in climate action? Are we going to do the obvious like reduction in energy costs? Are we going to expand the private sector profit margin? Is there any direct reduction in the cost of living which enables government to really invest in climate finance so that there is an ease on government support services? Or are we gonna promote increasing disposable incomes especially for the ordinary folk? No, I think the readiness approach to this is that GCF must support, as it does, CSOs, government entities, and private sector in terms of working concertedly towards a common goal, a common mutually beneficial goal that ensures governments can meet their five-year mandate and beyond, and the private sector can be assured that an investment now means greater returns in the future. Of course, the readiness finance must, and the readiness support rather, must create an enabling framework for investment. If we don't do this now, then there's no way in which government and private sector could partner for climate action. So that must build trust among potential investors. And it must also ensure that government stakeholders are seen in the way that they want to be seen by the electorate. And of course, we must look beyond the immediate returns of the investment as a government or even as a private entity and look beyond the near future when it comes to investing in climate action. The investment must match what people want, what the private sector wants and what the government wants. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are very insightful first set of comments on this first topic of uh, what are the barriers to address um, the present readiness programs and how we could use this to translate plans into action. Just to uh, involve the audience, if there is one question in this particular panel before we move on to two other rounds of questions, we could open it to any question from the floor. If there's anybody who would like to ask one question to our two uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, I have my colleague Anupa who is there in the back. If you would like to um, tell her your question, we could also uh, if you tell her, I'll also read it in my, my phone and read it out for you. Is there any question? I have this gentleman in the front. Um, if we could get a mic for you, maybe you could uh, ask your question. Anupa, is there a mic that we could give to our audience? Uh, Anupa is over there. Okay, so this gentleman in the front has raised his hand, yes. Maybe if you could kindly introduce yourself briefly before you ask your question. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Ohinio Furi. Uh, I'm from the Ministry of Environment of Ghana. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. My question is simple to the last speaker, His Excellency from St. Kitts and Nevis. Uh, I mean, I was struck when you asked or, you know, said that uh, the private sector should be also be incentivized to look beyond. And I was wondering, isn't that also government's role to be able to give an incentive for the private sector to look beyond, you know, projects that were um, short term? And what would you do specifically? Or do you have any ideas what you, you could do to open up that space for the private sector to be ambitious and look beyond short term projectizing? 
Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Minister, would you like to respond to that? Thank you for that question. It's an excellent question. And I re I'll respond with a very real experience from our cabinet just last week. And we were speaking about a solar energy project for St. Kitts and Nevis. And the basic the basic point was the government looked at the proposed investment from a private company and couldn't get beyond the initial million dollars, millions of dollars in terms of returns for the private sector and some energy cost savings and, and for the government. And the question then was, what's in it for the government? Why do we partner? Outside of the fact that you want to reduce your reliance on fossil fuels, you also want to ensure that the private sector doesn't get away with the best of the, the sweetest part of the deal. But you have to encourage the private sector, one, to look beyond not just the short term, look beyond making millions of dollars in terms of private and public sector partnerships, but also look beyond the finances and focus on how can the private sector make its money invest in social social development projects or invest in government projects and recognize that doing so means in 50 years you're going to have your company still in existence because it's making profits as opposed to a five to ten year profit margin so there must be some specific tangibles not just for the government but for private sector now encouraging them to look beyond is always a matter of how much dollars you can look beyond because you're not going to go far into the future unless you're carrying dollars with you and that's just a sad reality when it comes to private sector and public sector partnerships thank you for that um, extremely insightful uh, questions and comments so colleagues, if you are, uh, for this next round, while our panel members are uh, making their intervention, think of your uh, question if you have any, but I'll come to you at the end of this next round. So this next round, uh, we're gonna be talking about uh, uh, the new uh, readiness program and how it could be moved forward. So we will start off on this topic by asking uh, again, uh, Minister Tamimi, as you know, our board has asked us to come up with a new readiness strategy and present it to our board next year. What would be your three priorities that the GSEP should include into this new readiness strategy? Yeah. So we believe that this tool may be improved through, uh, through several approaches or improvement that includes, uh, first of all, offering capacity building a program for potential direct access entities, as we could consider have at least one accredited Direct access entities in each country is, is essential to max, maximize the ownership of results related to green climate fund projects and to enhance local expertise to plan, draft concepts and project documentation and implement uh, climate change projects. Second, the readiness need may differ from one country to another, depending on the existing plans and expected implementation schedules, as well as the nature of, of projects of national priority. Therefore, the needed yearly allocations may also vary according accordingly, which may not be satisfied by the current flat yearly allocation. The proposed three years readiness plans are good approach approach that gives more flexibility to the needs of member country. A notable mode of operation that the Green Climate Fund can use is the STAR allocations, which is System for Transparent Allocation of Resources of the Global Environment Facility, where they have fund in a place dedicated for each country upon request without the tough competition among other countries. These allocations are available based on the maturity of national plans. Third, the readiness window should also be expanded to include ad additional actors, including non-state actors, private sector, sub-national authorities, such as large cities and metropolitans. However, this has taken into consideration a more swift, swift access mode and approval procedure for such entities. The readiness projects offer, offer crucial tools to enhance the implementation of, for example, for Palestine, 
of a State of Palestine national agenda and secure fund for larger projects in priority sectors, including water, agriculture, and uh, energy. Um, at the end, I seize this opportunity to thank the Green Climate Fund for the support it's directing to the State of Palestine, and I'm really glad for the opportunity to express this interest of my country in this field. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, the minister noted the need to improve capacity of direct access entities. SPREP, who's here, is a direct access entity, but uniquely a regional direct access entity. Um, in this context, uh, Mr. Nawadra, what do you think are your three wishes for the next readiness strategy that we should include? Thank you, moderator. Um, I think the first one for me is more uh, approach than a priority. Um, it's looking at uh, us to do business more as a partnership. I think um, a lot of times we are on different ends of a discussion, whereas we should be working together to achieve uh, joint goals and joint uh, priorities that we have set ourselves. I hope in the new round that we are able to do this a bit more, that the Secretariat works a bit more with all of us to ensure that whatever strategies we put in place really work to meet the needs that we have. Um, listen to the needs that are being uh, raised and also consider the existing frameworks that we already have in our countries and regions. On the second priority, it would be a dedicated funding window for direct access entities such as uh, ourselves as a regional entity. SPREP uh, got into the business of becoming a accredited entity of the GCF, not because we wanted to, but because members asked us to fill this role. Uh, over the last six, seven years that we've been doing it, um, it's ended up costing us um, a lot of our own funds to fulfill this role. Or we need to go back to the countries and ask them if they can meet the, the upfront costs of many of the things that are needed to submit concepts and, um, and the proposals. Um, and it has come to the stage where it impacts on our own uh, primary role as a secretariat for our members to address environmental issues. So when push comes to sell, I think uh, we would rather be a secretariat than a direct access entity. So this is crucial for us. We need to have a funding window that addresses the needs that we have in order to serve the countries that we are supposed to be serving. And the final one is um, one that was raised by uh, the minister from Jamaica. I know the issue of oceans is not uh, on the GCF agenda or windows yet, but it needs to be. And uh, I think we need to prepare for that to happen. So maybe yeah. that is something that we can start addressing through this new readiness cycle. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are very important topics that uh, are raised with us. Now we move, in addition to this, we will also ask, um, in this case, um, um, Deputy Minister John Kumar from the Minister of Finance of Ghana. Uh, Minister, what on Reddin support received so far in, in relation to the support that you've received so far? What mechanisms can be improved or added that can accelerate support and access to climate finance in particular in your country? Minister. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, and first of all, Ghana wish to commend the GCF for the support we have received so far in the sum of about 4.75 million US dollars to strengthen capacity under the readiness uh, program. And we are very grateful for that. Um, the key challenge uh, in respect to climate uh, change is the issue of access to finance and inadequate capacity. And going forward, we have a few proposals to make that in order to overcome the stumbling blocks 
of institutional policy and legal framework as the GCF prepares for its replenishment, the following recommendations should be considered. We think that GCF should fast track the approval of readiness support. The name speaks for itself, readiness. is expected to prepare institution and country assess bigger funds and implement climate actions. There should be more national delivery partners or direct access entities with the requisite capacity to deliver on the mandate of readiness support countries, to support countries. GCF should have a dedicated capacity building portfolio for African countries to enhance readiness design, implementation and reporting. And GCF should consider the establishment of dedicated grant portfolio for African countries to support adaptation projects. This is very key in the sense that for Africa, adaptation plays a very important role in contributing to emission reduction through mitigation co-benefit technologies. And also the amount the readiness support gives annually, which is about $1 million, we propose that it should be increased to up to $5 million. And it should not be flat for every country, uh, depending on the country per year. And this will help strengthen the existing capacity of national private sector entities to leverage more green financing. The increase in readiness amount will ensure that we deepen the awareness and appreciation of the subnational level, especially in some countries you have the national levels and the district levels. And in order to reach them, you may need more financial assist assistance. Then the national circumstances should inform GCF approval of project proposals. The one size fits all approach should be avoided. For example, in the case of Ghana, the focus among others is to strengthen and modernize agriculture and build resilience in the economy. And in our engagement, we want to have that um, emphasis. And the accreditation processes appear cumbersome, time consuming and expensive. GCF should consider simplifying its accreditation processes so that national entities that are familiar with local issues and challenges can actively take part in the process. And there's need to identify ways to enhance the communication between GCF, NDAs, and delivery partners. In this regard, GCF should provide more financial support to the NDAs and to be able to function properly and improve their communication and engagement channels. And finally, we wish to encourage donor and private sector partners who are present to honor their pledges to GCF to enable the GCF to mobilize the needed financial resources to be made available for beneficiary countries. And I believe that our collective efforts will preserve our continent, our planet from extremes of climate change. Thank you. Many thanks, Minister. I think there's a growing consensus of these. Many thanks for that. Uh, it seems to be uh, also an important aspect by, the, uh, as noted by the audience. And we'll get back to the audience. Please uh, already consider some of your questions and uh, or maybe additions that you would like to highlight as well. This is a very good opportunity for you to do this. We have one more question and then we'll open the floor to the audience. Please st start thinking of your questions. And uh, this question goes to the Honorable uh, Minister uh, Clark. Um, Minister, based on your experience, what will be your suggestion to improve the GCF readiness yearly cycle? As you know, we know the yearly cycle, and sometimes you, you tend not to get the funding because you miss the cycle, uh, and it's always a rush at the end of the cycle. It's always a, a problem for many of us. Uh, and the allocation per country with a focus also on the AEs. If there's any kind of perspective that you think we can improve, Minister. Thank you for that question. It's very interesting that I received that question based on your, your previous comments. He, he basically answered the question, which is very simple. One, and I'll echo the sentiments of my colleague at the end, 
when an entity, an NDA, for example, is consumed by the work of GCF in order to get a country ready, then we know we have a problem. Accessing climate finance shouldn't be so overwhelming for an NDA or even the DAE that you can't focus on other mandates for your country. So that's one. Then there's always the issue of, which is the case where St. Kitts and Nevis, the issue of meeting a deadline, meeting a deadline. You spend six months trying to get a project ready, uh, a readiness project ready, only to have a very short window to spend it to start the cycle again. So there must be a challenge there in terms of meeting that cycle, especially when the cycle doesn't even coincide with the budget year of, of the country, which means there must be some attempt to create more localized approach to the readiness yearly cycle for the country or even at a geographic level for the region. And additionally, when it comes to the allocation of the country, I can only report support you it cannot be the same for every country and we must finally we must consider the cost for capacity development if it's too expensive for a DAE to facilitate GCF then something is wrong in terms of how we are budgeting the finances for this you must also consider the cost that the DAE would um, assume in terms of getting everyone else ready so those are my comments on that Thank you very much, Minister. So um, at this stage, we would like to open the floor for questions from the audience and these very insightful comments from the panel before, yes, over here from Cook Islands. Uh, if we could bring the, the mic. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much. we're going to try and put the, this microphone on. Okay. Okay. Right. Can you hear me? Maybe short introduction first. Sure. My name's Wayne. I'm the uh, NDA for um, the Cook Islands, work out of the office of the Prime Minister. Um, I've been listening um, to all of your interventions and actually find commonality with some of our own thinking, particularly. But I just wanted to raise two points or two questions, if I may. Um, I think we need to realise that readiness is a dynamic um, sort of process that firstly on an annual basis we need to be building our capability and enabling and frameworks so that's sort of a given but we also see that it cha it's changing there's transitioning going on between an annual allocation to now a multi-year allocation and the, the rationale in our eyes is that um, it allows certainty around contractors, but it also actually takes a longer term approach to the readiness program. So the question is, is that something that you yourselves have thought about uh, in your countries? And then the other one, which seems to be sort of not mentioned too well, is that the NAP process is under the readiness program. And we've been talking in the international sort of negotiations process about why the NAP is not a recurrent allocation. And so we'd just like to put it to you to ask you if that is something you've also thought about because a one-off allocation for an adaptation program in our eyes um, is not where it should be. It should be actually a more recurrent process just like readiness itself. Thank you. Thank you for that. Very good point because NAP is one off, $3 million. And it's supposed to bring your strategies into action, but your NDCs keep on evolving over time. What happens if you've used up your NAP allocation? It's a very good question, and I think that uh, should be explored. But we take one more question from the floor, and then we come back to our panel. Anybody else who would like to ask a question, maybe from the center, because we've had this from this side and this side. Anybody from the center? I can't see from this because there's a bright light. There, there you go from the center. Maybe somebody could bring the, the microphone over the center. Yes, please kindly introduce yourself before asking the question. Yes, thank you. My name is Anna Vokopola. I represent Urban Research Institute from Albania as a delivery partner. Uh, I'm looking at the other side of the things now. I work with NDA and I see that NDAs usually are overloaded with work because they are uh, the 
public uh, employees who do other things beside being the NDA and they are very busy. Uh, I think that uh, the, the issue that the ministry raised of more funding will be the second before the first issue, which is how to spend the funding, the readiness money in time. That's the main issue. And since delivery partners such as us are connected with both GCF on contractual terms and NDAs on the bureaucratic work we do, and, AD, and they are also the main beneficiary, I would kindly ask, ask uh, the GCF for some advice on time, timing, timing responses, uh, timing uh, products, and put some conditions uh, that will make both parties deliver in time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. I think you raise a very important topic. One is the availability of the resource, the other is actually using them. Because uh, many countries do not actually access the full 1 million per year. And it's a, it's a fact, it's, a, it's more of an absorption issue, but it could also be other things, but it would be good to explore those things. So we have very interesting questions from the floor. One from this side, on the timing, one year to three years, what do you think of this? I think you've already raised it. And the question the NAPS, very relevant. Nobody has raised it from the panel yet. And then, of course, this issue of um, how do we look at the timing uh, of uh, the implementation? So if anybody from the panel would like to take this, uh, uh, anybody from the panel would like to take it? Yes, go ahead. Yep. I'll uh, maybe start with the absorptive uh, capacity issue. This is a very real challenge in the Pacific. Uh, not only is there um, lack of capacity in the countries because of the small size of the administrations and the uh, also the technical ability within the country to provide the the services that are needed, uh, the consultants, the uh, the different studies that are often needed. Um, so it is a very real challenge. And um, I'm not sure, maybe there's some way of uh, addressing that. And the second issue that uh, Wayne raised on maybe how there could be a longer term way of uh, addressing it, um, where things that are not spent in a year, if you were able to plan it out to, to uh, add on to what you use in the next year, because sometimes it takes a while to start things off. But once things roll, um, they could probably use up the full amount for the next year and the balance of the first year if it was done in a longer term arrangement so they can really plan things out in a longer term way. Um, it's just a thought I had. And then they can link it to the changing the NAPs to be, uh, to be in line with the the changes to the NDCs that they uh, go through. Thank you. Uh, many thanks. Uh, in the Caribbean, uh, maybe I should, I just want to ask uh, Minister Clark, in the Caribbean, I do realize that um, there are instances that when uh, the readiness allocation is not being used for the year, you have given it to the regional entity. I think in this case, five Cs, to be then provided as a service to the region. Now, has there is has that been what's your experience in this? Because I don't think this has happened in the Pacific or elsewhere. Maybe you could just share with us your experience with that. Sharing is caring. Let's start here. <laughs> but <clears throat> I do recall um, some years ago, probably a year and a half ago, when the um, NDA focal point said to me, "Well, we haven't used our resources, so we are passing the money on." And then I was on the outside of the GCF process, I was not in government and I was very distraught, but stepping into government, I realized that there are times when the amount of work in the NDA just cannot allow for the absorption of the funds and it's better you pass the funds onto the regional entity. And that works because in our region, it remains with us. This might not be the case for every single country or even every region because the, the needs are so varied. However, if that can be what we call like a stopgap where you, you, a country can't use it, but it doesn't disappear. 
but I really do like the suggestion from my colleague where if if you can't use it, allocate it to the upcoming year. So it's still yours. It doesn't just disappear altogether because at the end of the day, we want countries to be able to access the readiness finance. We want countries to get ready to access finance. And if you're going to prioritize getting ready for finance, you don't take it away, even if there are extenuating circumstances, which just prevents you from accessing the readiness finance in that particular year. But the regional approach to it is, is useful. There are some kinks that need to be ironed out, but it's, it's useful if we go back to my original point, sharing is caring. Thank you very much. Um, we haven't really answered the question of the NAPs. Uh, so I would like to ask um, uh, either Minister Kanimi or um, in this case, um, Minister Kuma, if you have any opinion about this one-off NAP allocation, because I think it's a very valid point. What do you think? In the next Red in a Strategy, do you think this should be revisited? Maybe Minister Kanimi first? Okay, so you the person. Okay, go ahead, please. Um, yes, um, I think it is very important to have that allocation done, and uh, also not to time it within a very short frame for its usage. I think the crucial um, difficulty has been with the time frame for spending the allocation and sometimes the processes you go through to get the approval uh, you spend so much time and by the time you get the approval you don't have um, uh, enough time to expend it before you can apply for the next phase so i think that we can do that with some variations by ensuring that we do the allocation and allow the country enough time to be able to use it thank you very much Anybody else would like to? Yes, please. Thank you. I, I think we need to look at them all as uh, instruments to enable you to meet your obligations under the convention. So if your NDCs are changing, then it should follow that your NAPs need to change. And uh, the financing mechanism for the, secretary, for the convention should be able to finance that to happen. So if we follow that uh, simple logic, then it makes sense that you need to align all these things so that it enables the countries to meet their obligations under the convention. Thank you. Thanks for that. In fact, uh, there is an update of the NDCs coming up in 2025 and another one in 2030. So if you've already developed your NAP, that means that you are your hands are tied. I think you make a very good point there. Um, so with that, I think we close this. We have a third round of questions. Uh, we will cover that. And we, in fact, this is a very good segue because we're going to be covering the NAPs. So in this third uh, uh, segment, we will be discussing opportunities and uh, the improvements on the readiness program dedicated to adaptation planning, which is the NAPs. And uh, we, will, uh, we will then take up the rest of the time uh, for this segment. So um, for this topic, uh, we have two questions and we'll uh, start off uh, on this one with uh, Deputy Minister uh, Kuma from, uh, from Ghana. And um, Minister, the question is, how can a specific readiness window on adaptation planning continue and deepen the support for adaptation, which is fundamentally already what you already answered. Uh, how do you think this should, should, should be done if we're going to uh, develop this uh, um, continued support for adaptation? Minister. Um, thank you very much. Um, I think that we should do much more engagements and um, interactions like this are a very good platform to share ideas. And over the years, the implementation of the program has um, brought a lot of experience uh, to GCF and its partners. And we know what works in what region and what countries and what doesn't necessarily work. And one of the evidence is the fact that even the 1 million allocation is not sometimes fully exhausted by some countries. It's not because they don't have need for it, but maybe the processes of assessing it and how to make it impactful into the country has not been properly aligned with the objective of those countries. So I think that going forward, regular engagements and reviewing the processes 
for allowing countries to be able to assess these facilities on time will help to enhance the program and, and focus it uh, with changing trends uh, in every country. Thank you very much. So definitely there needs to be some more work uh, on the NAVs, and I think it remains to be seen on how we could uh, try and facilitate that. Now, let's go back to this issue of private sector. As we know, um, it, it's, uh, if you look at the NAP guidelines, it's actually uh, put in there that uh, uh, countries, if they so wish, could actually engage the private sector, including in the development of the national adaptation plans. Uh, and as one of our uh, delivery partners in the region, SPREP has been very active also in uh, supporting countries develop maps. But in addition to that, I think uh, Pacific has been very active in uh, innovative approaches for joint adaptation planning. I think Pacific is the uh, first ones, I think, in the region or in the world to do, to do JNAPs, Joint National Action Plans, which uh, cut across various topics in the world. So uh, the question is to uh, Mr. Nawadra from SPREP. What suggestions or insights can you share on how countries can catalyze private sector engagement in adaptation. And if you have any other uh, views on the NAPs, uh, how we could improve it uh, to engage the private sector. Thank you. Um, on the private sector issue, I think our, the way we engage needs to suit the private sector within our own countries or own regions. The private sector in the Pacific and I could probably say in most SIDS, is uh, quite different from what the private sector is in the larger countries and regions. Uh, we don't have the big corporations that uh, you have in many other places. Ours is more small or local, national or regional businesses, SMEs. Uh, the larger, what we call private sector, are mostly uh, state-owned or uh, semi-state-owned um, corporations, uh, such as our utilities, the airlines, uh, hotels, energy, airports, ports. So it's uh, whatever engagement we do needs to suit our context. Um, there should be some, there is potential too for regional engagement of the private sector to have uh, economies of scale. In the Pacific, we used to have the Pacific Island uh, private sector organization, um, but it's gone, hasn't been functioning for a while. So there may be room to bring this back in as an umbrella organization for, for the private sector. And uh, the engagement focus should not only be about mobilizing finance, because many of our private sector in the region don't have much finance. So the focus can be on building partnerships, building capacity, building um, sharing of knowledge and, and collectively learning from each other so that we have, um, uh, we establish national and regional communities of practice and innovation through these networks and partnerships. We need to bring the private sector into the existing networks we already have with governments, with NGOs, with CSOs, with academia. So they become a, a party at the table working together on these NAPs and all these other instruments that we, we put in place. Um, the opportunity may lie in a partnership style model where you have uh, multiple partners, both public and private rather than trying to bring private in on their own in our context. Um, looking at uh, national banks and financial institutions, they already lead in, in formatting these blended financing structures. DCF could look to support them with financing and building their internal processes and capacity for technical support and management to the private sector. And we also need help with, uh, within the government frameworks to establish the enabling environment for private sector to be more actively involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, private sector engagement, especially in the way that we are now trying to build investment plans out of our NDCs, 
using readiness and using maps uh, to do so is quite important because government alone cannot do all of the work. So um, we open the floor for any questions or clarifications. Alternatively, if any of you would like to highlight your three priorities for the new readiness strategy that we will be developing for next year, this is your opportunity to give us your views because we are capturing these uh, feedback uh, to help us frame the new readiness strategy. So any comments or questions from the floor? This is a good opportunity. Yes, sir, from the front. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Alex Guerra from the National Climate Change Council in Guatemala. Uh, I very much appreciate the comments by our colleagues in the panel, as they have uh, stressed the particular conditions of developing countries in terms of long-term term planning and how that doesn't match with government priorities uh, the lack of uh, capacity building and and also with the funding. So I very much appreciate that. But my question is, uh, there is a lot of talk about the private sector, but what private sector are we talking about and whether there are uh, any differences? Is it multinational companies that work in your countries or is it national companies is it investment in sort of profit-driven activities, for example, in the energy sector? That, that is the case in, uh, sometimes. And it's not a bad thing because it still helps the country uh, reduce emissions, for example, and advance in, in those uh, goals, but uh, that's good. Or is it more um, uh, helping communities adapt and so it, it becomes more a philanthropic approach so sort of um, looking more at those aspects and um, nuances when we talk about the private sector. Thanks. Any thanks for that question? We, we hold off on answering it. We, we take another question from, from the floor, from the gentleman in the floor, and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, sir, please. It's working? OK. Uh, my name is Saber Kelbuna. I'm from. Uh, uh, I think the conflict in the planning process uh, is a dilemma that needs to be solved some way or another. Uh, unfortunately, many of the countries do have uh, such dilemma on their national level between the, the planning between uh, different ministries or different entities within the country. But uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, green Climate Fund. I think it's uh, it would be useful to have some kind of agenda for the uh, planning process that uh, the uh, the countries who benefit from the fund here uh, can relate their plans to it, and uh, I suppose that will make. Uh, the process of uh, submitting the proposal and the, the, the whole process of uh, getting fund more uh, uh, faster and uh, it will uh, allow for the opportunity to match the, the priorities of the national countries or national plans with the funding plans of the GCF. Uh, maybe just like uh, uh, a rough agenda of the expected plans and a rough content for it would assist the uh, the national uh, entities to uh, to work in uh, parallel to to that. Thank you. Many thanks for that. I think indeed a very important suggestion guide to planning. Um, so we come back to our panel. If you would like to. Um, maybe respond to the question related to private sector. What is private sector in your view? And secondly, uh, how can we guide planning better? I think, uh, Minister from Ghana, you would like yes. to suggest this. Uh, Thank you very much. I, I want to make a point about the private sector. In Ghana, 
um, let me say the MSMEs, the micro, small, medium enterprises constitute about 90% of the businesses or private sector in, in the economy. And they create about um, 80% of jobs in that sector and contribute to about 70% of the GDP. And um, Her Excellency talked about the permanency nature of the private sector compared to government, which may have to run on term basis every four years or five years or uh, two terms, then you have to change. There is a need to, because of the dominance of the private sector in virtually many economies, it is important to have a program that targets all the private sector uh, and not necessarily discriminating. It should rather be incentive-based approach where you encourage them not to look only for profits and commercial interest in their businesses, but something for them to benefit for being conscious about the environment and how they can also protect some promote social good. So um, I believe that because of the impact of the private sector, we have to have an approach that targets all of them, but it should be on incentive base and not just on profit. It should only be commercial interest for their businesses, but how can they also protect the environment and think about sustainability and, and even the future generation. So uh, these are some of the interventions that I think when we are able to consciously engage the, the private sector, it will help in preserving uh, climate change and, and, and of course, um, preserving the planet for, for future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anybody else from the panel would like to answer? If not, there are two more. Uh, yes, please, from Spread. Okay. Thank you. I think the first step is really bringing the private sector to the table so that they can decide for themselves how best they can contribute. And then the other issue is, um, I think in the Pacific, at least, most of our private sector, like Ghana, is the small, medium, enterprise type of private sector. I think uh, for them, it's more how they can be assisted to take action to, to improve on their practices to meet uh, climate change goals. But we also have in our countries the larger multinationals. So the engagement with them needs to be different. It needs to be done at their headquarters, so not necessarily in the countries themselves. Uh, so that's something that could be considered. How can the uh, readiness maybe help countries to enable them to engage where these multinational corporations are headquartered, where they can really have discussions on how they can contribute to adaptation in, in their countries or regions? Thank you. Many thanks for that. I was recently at the Finance and Economic Ministers meeting in the Pacific. And in that discussion with private sector, there was the airline companies who were actually discussing with ministers. And of course, their discussion was, you know, they are really hit by COVID. And uh, in, in the context of the economic recovery, there needs to be some engagement with these companies, especially in, uh, um, you know, concessional support. So there might be also these larger companies in the context of certain regions. Uh, I do understand that there are two more questions from the floor. We could take this before we wrap. And please, uh, if you could raise your hand, because I cannot see. Okay, o over this side, I think. Yes, please. And then maybe an another one from that side. So these are the last two questions. Um, yeah, I thank you very much again for the opportunity. I have a question, suggestion, um, work with me here. Um, I know that most part of the readiness that is given to countries are for capacity building. And for somebody like me, this is my first time, you know, coming to this conference and learning more about the GCF and its programming. Uh, it would have been such a shame. In fact, if given the role I'm playing now in my country, I came into, you know, um, uh, this programming and I didn't have any engagement or any capacity to be built just because the country was, uh, was not able to apply 
is for its readiness and they didn't receive the fund. So is it also possible that, you know, GCF could do a capacity needs assessment generic and then could say, take a proportion or, a, you know, a certain amount allocated to all NDAs for them to build capacities for that generic um, uh, capacities in their countries? Uh, it's a question, it's also a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much. We take the last question before we come back. I think this first question I would ask no to answer. Is this is a question of what can the GCF do? But we take that last question. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Pedro. I'm from uh, East uh, Timor or Timor Leste. Yeah, I would like to highlight about this uh, readiness support. If we uh, look at the GCF readiness guidebook Annex 5, there is a direct support for NDA $300,000 per year. But the mechanism of assessing that uh, support is very difficult. So uh, we would like to suggest uh, for the GCF uh, to have this uh, 300,000 direct support for NDA, uh, not uh, uh, the same as uh, the modality that deliver partner assessing the readiness. Because the, uh, to strengthen the NDA uh, with the data 300,000 cap per year, it's going to increase the capacity of NDA uh, to engage in the, all the stakeholders at the national level and also it will involve the private sector into assessing the GCF fund. So this is a, a, a modality to access that, but it's very difficult to get that. So uh, just to suggest the GCF to simplify that or to uh, support directly, especially the NDA to get that support. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There's the last one. Okay, yes, please. Last chance before we close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you for allowing me. Uh, I'm uh, Mohamed Anamul Karim Pavel. Uh, I am representing uh, it called Infrastructure Development Company Limited in Bangladesh. Uh, I'm, I'm the focal point. So just to, uh, I mean, a comment on number seven that is involving private sector in, in adaptation projects. So, I mean, as some other, some, someone comment, uh, commented that I mean uh, private sector is always I mean profit driven I mean if uh, we cannot structure the project in such a way that it, it, it will ensure their profitability probably it is very difficult to actually engage private sector but at the same time if we uh, 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 design the project in such a way that uh, I mean with uh, blended financing then probably uh, uh, some portion of uh, uh, constitutional financing, some grant support, probably uh, they will uh, be interested to actually participate in the in the project. Like we are now uh, developing one project uh, on uh, on uh, irrigation, uh, solar irrigation in the drought prone areas of the country, which is mainly adaptation as well as it has a mitigation opportunities. So there, I mean, that project uh, is expected to be actually implemented by the private sector. So um, uh, already we have done some pilot projects. So now we are uh, trying to make it a bigger scale and we have involved private sector in implementing that particular project. So, I mean, uh, my uh, uh, suggestion is that, I mean, if you can uh, um, structure the project uh, uh, in such a way that it, it, and, and, uh, it makes, uh, create in, creates interest in the private sector, probably, I mean, we can uh, involve private sector in adaptation project, but, Obviously, it's very difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we have one approved project on um, uh, greening the industrial um, corporation in uh, Bangladesh, we call, I think. We had that very large project. I think it's $250 million, one of our largest projects in Bangladesh, I think. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for. Uh, mentioning this, I mean, we 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 uh, actually got approval of uh, one uh, project uh, in energy efficiency uh, that is two hundred fifty six million dollar project, uh, and, and it will be implemented by the private sector. Thank you. I think uh, we have uh, one uh, final. Uh...
Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and our uh, honorable guests. Uh, I have a short question uh, to encourage private sector to invest in, in, in the industries that reduce climate change stress on economic and communities. Uh, I have a question about uh, preparation or development of awareness about insurance uh, against risk of climate change. Is it one of the priority of readiness priorities? Because I don't um, I, I hear any when I speak about uh, the relation of private sector and uh, insurance as incentives. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we come back to the panel, but just to note that the first two questions, because it's for the GCF, we take good note of it. And if it's in our record, we will take good note of it into the readiness uh, uh, strategy. Uh, and I think uh, if anybody from the panel would like to answer these uh, last two ones, especially if any of uh, the, the panel members have any experience of putting in insurance into your plans, is it a priority in your opinion? Any plans for your engagement with the GCF? Do you have anything? Just to let you know um, in, in this meeting that GCF is one of the largest funder of insurance among the multilateral climate funds. In fact, our portfolio of uh, insurance uh, coverage is fairly large and it's in multiple countries. It's in uh, things like agriculture uh, and so on, but uh, it's quite large, but I'm not sure to what extent it is embedded, for example, in NAPS or in uh, readiness support. If anybody from our panel would like to uh, respond, if you have any experience on this. Yes, Minister. Yes, um, no, not really, but I think it's an eye-opener. Uh, looking at the, the extreme of weather conditions and sometimes the impact on the population. We just saw the pictures from Pakistan. And I'm wondering how this population are going to cope in the absence of any insurance and how they are going to put their life together. So whilst we are seeking to work with the private sector, I think we must also deliberately encourage uh, insurance companies to have new products that can respond to natural disasters in, in, in the wake of wild uh, climate change problems that we have. I think it's a very good contribution and we will be conscious about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else on the panel? Yes, please. Yeah, I know it's not directly related to this forum, but um, this is something we continuously struggle with in the Pacific. Um, insurance, especially with the growing um, intensity and frequency of cyclones. Um, it's why we continue to pursue at the, the UNFCCC COPS um, the issue of loss and damage and uh, how we need to put in place exactly what uh, that question asked. How do we ensure our communities or have mechanisms in place to allow them to recover and build their communities back after these uh, various events? Like you say, it's, uh, it's something that is being discussed in other fora. Um, and uh, it's something that the Pacific and I know other seeds continuously take to the the COPs. Thank you. And I think in the UNFCCC, the guidance to us is that there are different layers of, of dealing with risk. Assessing the risk, reducing the risk, which is what you do in adaptation, preparing for the risk, you know, absorbing the risk, and then finally transferring the risk. And these are toolboxes that you deal with. You cannot have one because the different layers, some of it would be too costly to, to all absorb, to pay for, and there are certain layers that you have to transfer. So I think that's a, a key uh, intervention. Yes, Minister, you would yes. like to intervene. I'd like to support what my colleague just mentioned about loss and damage, especially for the Caribbean islands. And the reality is, Loss and damage speaks directly to every citizen in St. Kitts and Nevis or in the Caribbean. We must find a way to bring that to the table, especially and even with private sector engagement. And as we speak to issues of insurance, we are seeing more climate migration in smaller islands. And regardless of what we do, it's going to be a reality, especially for the coastal communities. How do you support 
persons who have already invested their lifetime savings in in settlements on the coast and are now told by government you must move or for themselves are seeing that they have to move it's the issue loss and damage that connects climate action climate finance to regular folk we have to deal with it thank you very much I think we've come to the end of our session, but before we close, I'm going to ask our panel if you if there is any final words that you would like to to say, something that uh, you think we should highlight at the end of this, because this is a very important topic and very close to all of our hearts. If there's any final words you would like to uh, to to give uh, to to all of us, in particular the GCF, because we are indeed taking notes. Anybody from the panel would like to give your parting words. Uh, otherwise, I could uh, um, summarize uh, the session. It's okay. Okay. So thank you very much. I think this session uh, gave us a lot of uh, insights and inputs. And um, uh, more importantly for us, the suggestions that you have given us on uh, what we should take away, um, especially now that we're developing the new readiness strategy. Things that we've heard is uh, converting this new uh, work as a partnership. I think this is something, a new modality of work. Um, it should be dealt with as a partnership. And you said that uh, things that we should try and consider is developing a new dedicated funding window for direct access entities so that the direct access entities do not come and be taken out of the country allocation. So a, a new window for them and the readiness. You noted the importance of capacity building and uh, not just the direct access entities, but also uh, various actors. You noted a list of them, non-state actors, you know, private sector and their engagement. Uh, there was a note on how this could be done, including developing development of guidelines and uh, certain guidance on um, maybe even best practices on how this could be done. There was a call for increasing the allocation because uh, you noted that uh, 1 million per year, although in some countries it is not used, you noted that in some other countries, more is needed. So giving that uh, ability to access more, if needed, is uh, what you're, you're looking for. And then finally, as noted by many of you, you said that there needs to be a look at sim simplifying the process and making the process more flexible to allow uh, countries who do not use their allocation to, to flexibly use it in subsequent years. So I think the message of sim simplification, flexibility, uh, and, and uh, ability to access more of these readiness uh, resources. As we know, the readiness, as the title suggests, it is to make you ready. Because ultimately, the end result is that you access the larger funding window. That is the ultimate goal. So obviously, you cannot just constantly be accessing readiness because what we hope is that at some point you become a little bit ready and then you're able to access the larger projects. And I do hope that this discussion had been that uh, give us that some insight on how that could happen. And we have taken good note in the session and um, we, would, we would like to close. But before we do so, we would like to thank our panel members for a very insightful discussion. And this last session was not scripted. So thank you very much for bearing with all of us because uh, this interaction was very useful. But I think it was also useful for the audience because you're part of the discussion. So maybe let's give a warm, warm hand for, for our panel members and also for all of you for participating. Thank you very much.